My name is Bud Jeremy, and I'm the Associate Dean of the School of Continuing Education in Summer Sessions. And I hope you've come to some of our events this summer, whether it be a, a concert or a lecture, and we still have another week to go, uh, so I hope we'll see some of you there. As you may know, uh, Cornell counts among its recent alums some noted political pundits. In addition to Ann Coulter, who received a BA degree in history, cum laude from the College of Arts and Sciences in 1984, Keith Olbermann received a BS degree in communication arts from the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences in 1979. In keeping with President Obama's call for balanced approaches, since Mr. Olbermann was on campus this spring, we have someone with us tonight who represents all things, both big red and just plain red. Sarah Elizabeth Cup graduated from the College of Arts and Sciences in 2000 with a BA in History of Art. While attending Cornell, she wrote for the Cornell Daily Sun as the gender anonymous S.E. Cup, and that name is stuck. Last year, she earned an MA degree with a concentration in religious studies from New York University. Essie, a self-identified atheist, is the author of Losing Our Religion, the liberal media's attack on Christianity, and the co-author of Why You're Wrong About the Right. Essie is also a political columnist and culture critic. She writes a regular online column for the New York Daily News and a regular feature at the Daily Caller. She is a contributing editor at Town Hall Magazine and a regular contributor to Politico's Arena. She has been published in the Washington Post, Newsmax, Slate, Human Events, The American Spectator, Sports Illustrated Online, Maxim Online, NASCAR.com, and the Detroit Free Press, among others. Finally, S.E. is a political commentator. She has appeared on MSNBC, CNN, C-SPAN, Fox News, and she is a regular guest on television programs of all varieties and on dozens of radio shows that span the political spectrum, from the Dennis Miller Show to the Ellen Combs Show. She hosts her own program, S.E. Cup Show, on Glenn Beck's GBT, TV, I'm sorry. Born in California, she grew up primarily in Andover, Massachusetts, and she now lives in New York. A classically trained ballet dancer in her spare time, she fishes and she hunts and she attends all sorts of sporting events, including NASCAR races. Essie Cup, let's talk about politics, turning your opinions into a career. Hi. Thanks for coming. Uh, and, and welcome. I, uh, I understand there are some adults here taking adult classes. I can't imagine a more beautiful place to spend the summer. And to the students who are summer college students here, um, I, I would mock you for having the terrible judgment to go to school in the summer, except I did it too, here many years ago. Uh, so congrats and enjoy. Um, in fact, I was telling our gracious host that when I came here for summer college, at the end of that experience, I fell in love with Cornell and wanted to come back for college. So I met with one of the deans here, whose name will be unsaid, to ask him how I could ensure my, my chances of getting in. And he not so politely told me, Cornell's not for everyone. You should probably think about going elsewhere. Um, I had a different opinion, uh, clearly, and thus the, the topic of today's um, discussion. And I don't want to lecture at you too long, especially for those of you who are in school right now. I'm sure you get that all day. I really want to turn it over to your questions, but I will go through sort of the, um, the routes you can take toward becoming a pundit or a columnist or a professional opinion maker. Um, there are three ways to become a pundit for television news. We'll start there. Um, I'll tell you first how I landed here, and then uh, I'll tell you about the other two, two roads. Um, to turn your opinion into a job, it really helps if you have strong opinions. Now, that sounds obvious, but you know the saying, 
and my parents are in the audience, but opinions are like, everyone has one. So to be successful in opinion, um, whether that's as a columnist or an author or as a pundit or as a radio host, you're, you really have to have opinions that are interesting and fresh, provocative, um, well-articulated and well-informed. And that's, that's harder than it sounds. Um, I've always been told from a very young age that I was too opinionated. Um, in second grade, I was given a timeout for protesting loudly that math is stupid. I've since softened my opinion, um, but I continue to stand firm on the idea that calculus is totally overrated. I can barely add, and look at me now. In high school, I argued with the Catholic school nuns about the existence of God. I don't think I changed any minds, but I'm pretty sure I gave them something to think about. <laughs> and in fact, when I got to college, I decided I'd make a career out of being opinionated by becoming an art critic. I was an art history major. I worked in publications at the Johnson Museum here. Um, I wrote art reviews for the Cornell Daily Sun and eventually became the arts editor. I had fantasies that I would get a job at Art Forum and haunt the New York art galleries wearing discerning spectacles and making artists very nervous, writing scathing reviews about the guy who paints oversized phalluses, and throwing fabulous dinner parties that Mike Nichols would attend and the New Yorker would write about. It's easier said than done. Instead, I got a job at an online magazine called drinks.com. And it's what it sounds like. I wrote about wine, beer, and liquor, and was sent to all the bars in Manhattan and on the Eastern Seaboard to write reviews. It was a pretty sweet job out of college. Um, not surprisingly, it folded in four months. So then I was sort of out of my own. And I started freelancing. Uh, I wrote for travel guides, like Fodor's road guides. I wrote for The Bond Buyer, which is a municipal bond daily newspaper, which was as terrible as it sounds. I had no business being there. Um, and a couple other places. And eventually I got a job at the New York Times. I was not published. It was sort of a behind the scenes reference section. Basically what I did was I took the sports section every day, rewrote it so that it was shorter into what we call an abstract, and then it goes into a reference guide so you could look it up by, um, by topic, by keyword. I did that for eight years. And it was fun and a great opportunity, but I got antsy doing that. Um, and so midway through, I decided I'd go to grad school at NYU and I would start writing a book, um, which is the first way you can turn your opinion into a job. Uh, I was a nobody and a conservative, not exactly a literary agent's dream client. I had a co-author and we relentlessly pursued literary agents, which is the process. You can't go directly to a publisher. We got terrible responses, not just rejections, but like hostile scoldings. Um, I hope your teeth fall out. I would never work with Republican kids. You're swimming in the blood of the American children. Quotes, these are quotes. You'd think that giving away 15% of your money would be easier, um, but it wasn't. Finally, it, it took about nine months, and finally we got a great agent who sold our book to Simon & Schuster in like two weeks, which is great. So we started promoting the book, did some radio, did some TV, um, and that was great. I wanted writing opportunities, so I pursued those. It's, it's hard to get published if you've never been published before. Editors don't like to take chances on, on unknowns. Um, they like to know they're not the first ones to try you out. So they're, they're risk averse. It's hard getting published the first time. Um, but I worked my tail off, um, turning no's into, into maybes. I'd get rejections and I'd, I'd send my pieces all over the place every day and write editors back and ask again, and I was, I was relentless, and you have to be. Finally, I started building my clips, and more importantly, my relationships with editors, and they like repeat business. They like professionalism and reliability, predictability. 
They want to be able to trust you to turn your pieces in on time with minimal errors, errors without emoticons, and that every time your pieces are going to sound like you. They like to know what they're about to get. My current editor at the Daily News, where I have a, a weekly column now, was one of the first editors I ever pitched to. And he said no dozens, dozens of times. Um, but sure enough, when a woman named Sarah Palin hit the stage, uh, and he found out that I was one of three writers who had ever heard of her, I wrote one of the first opinion pieces on Palin to appear in a New York paper. And he kept using me throughout the election, and then after the election was over, offered me my own column space. Um, and of all the jobs I do, that's by far my favorite. As for television, I was doing a little TV um, around the book and, and afterward, and radio here and there, but as a generalist, it was up to me to find ways to prove to producers and bookers that I could be relevant week after week. Um, experts on various fields um, have specific stories they'll be called in for, so terrorism experts, foreign policy experts. I remember I was at Fox once, and it was around the time that there was a lot of Somali pirate activity. And I saw a booker get on the phone, and we need a, a pirate expert. Does anybody know a pirate guy? And in fact, I did. He went to Cornell. I recommended him. He came in and for two weeks had like the best two weeks of his life talking about pirates. <laughs> so, you know, people like John Bolton, for example, get called to talk about foreign policy. And he knows he's not going to be called to talk about Snooky, you know, um, or Tiger Woods. I don't have that luxury. Um, I'm a generalist, so one week it's Snooky, the next week it's Anthony Weiner. Um, now it's the debt, and I'm interviewing Eric Cantor and Paul Ryan, and it's uh, a, little, a little of everything. But being a generalist, this is something you should think about, is, is good and bad. Uh, you get lots of work and exposure because you're not just talking about one thing. Um, I've done almost every show on every network. Um, and it's exciting, it's never dull, because you basically get to talk about anything you want. Uh, the downside is I spend about half my day watching the news and reading newspapers and magazines and blogs just to keep up with everything that's going on. Um, it's, it's hard work, and frankly, when I go on vacation, it's easier to just keep up, keep up with everything rather than come home and have to download on like a week of stuff that I missed. And it's not just news stories. I have to watch what people are saying about those news stories too. So that's a, a huge part of my job. And if you're an expert on something, you can sort of filter out the stories you don't really need to pay attention to. I doubt John Bolton is following what's going on with Snooky, the Jersey Shore, which is very nice for him. Um, and so you could be called, I could be called to comment on anything, anytime. Um, and you, you got to be ready. And when you're starting out especially, uh, you always want to be able to say yes. I think in the first two years of, of doing this, I, I didn't say no once to anything. You want to do this radio? You want to do this TV? You want to write about this? Yes. The answer is always yes. Um, so it's, it's a lot of work being a generalist, but, but fun. What was particularly helpful for me in keeping myself on producers and bookers' minds when I was starting out, and, and this is sort of an inside tip here, um, was keeping a thorough email list of all of the media contacts that I met. Um, whether you know, I thought I was gonna work with them again or not, I put them all on an email list. And when I got writing jobs, I sent everyone on that list, the column I had just written, so that they knew when they were going to book stories or book a segment or book a guest, I was talking about that. And if they wanted me for a guest, they knew what I was talking about and they knew what I thought about it already. So I basically did their job for them. They didn't even have to pick up the phone. And that was a really good way to get into producers and bookers' um, Rolodex. Uh, they don't have to ask what I'm working on. I send it to them. And sometimes they just need to fill a, a, a block and they don't know what the story is going to be, but they see that I'm writing about something and maybe like, oh, great, come on in and talk about it. We need to fill time. So it's really helpful. Um, in the beginning, I felt really obnoxious and self-promotional, sending them all of this stuff, but trust me, um, they really appreciate it. It makes their job a lot easier. And if you have any interest in being a pundit or a columnist, you have to get used to being self-promotional because no one's going to promote you.
for you. You have to do it, especially when you're starting out. Um, so over time, I, I built a reputation, not um, as someone who is particularly brilliant, although I like to think I am, um, but as someone who was professional and easy to work with. And let me tell you, in this business, that goes a really long way. Showing up on time, being polite to the hair and makeup people, um, you know, being gracious and grateful for opportunities, coming prepared. These are things that might seem, seem obvious, but you would be surprised how many people show up with attitude, they're unprepared, they're dismissive of, of you know, non-talent. Um, that's a really quick way to end your career uh, in, in a heartbeat in this business. So there, there is a personal side, and, and frankly, you know, we're not all Paul Krugman and Charles Krauthammer. Sometimes we need to bring some charm to get asked back. Um, so these are things to keep in mind. It is still a, a people business. Um, as, as much as everything's online and as, as fast-paced as the media is, it's still a people business. They appreciate courtesy. So for two years, about, I hustled. Um, said yes to everyone, pushed my writing around, promoted the hell out of my writing on Facebook and Twitter and everywhere else I could. Um, and in that time, managed to write another book and get a graduate degree, um, travel around the country to do speaking engagements like this, and um, had a full-time job, meanwhile. So it was hard, it was a lot of work. But eventually, after eight years, I, I quit the New York Times last May and was literally out on my own having a job based on my opinions. That was it. And it felt really good, but it, it's, it's still a hustle. I mean, I'm, I'm still working really hard, and um, it's, it's always hard because the news cycle moves very quickly, and you have to keep up with it. It's a competitive field anyway. It's a very small field. So if, if you're work-averse, it's probably not the career for you. Um, so way number one to become a pundit is to write a book. For whatever reason, writing a book still carries some cachet, even if your mother is the only person that reads it. Getting a book published is something people think um, is, is difficult, and it is. It's not something you can do in a, in a minute. It takes time. It takes some discipline. So when a producer or an editor sees published author after your name, for whatever reason, it carries some weight. They like to know that you've been, you've been tested, you can write, you can write long form, um, so write a book, start promoting it, and um, that's, that's one sort of, I won't say quick, but quick-ish way into the business, especially if you can write about something super timely, provocative, and opinion-based. I'm not talking about sort of an academic kind of book. That, that's not easy. If you write good opinion and uh, it's about something people care about, that's one way in. Um, the other two ways you can become an opinion professional, one, and we, we talked about this a little bit, become an expert in something. Um, go into the field in your area of interest, pirates, maybe. Um, get some experience, get published academically or, or in mass market, and be the guy who everyone calls when there's a tsunami or um, an Indonesian coup or uh, a drop in consumer spending, or a malaria outbreak in the Sudan, whatever it is, and the more specific you can get, the better, because then you're not competing against other pirate guys, and tsunami guys, and Indonesia coup guys. Um, you can corner the pirate market, or the Indonesian coup market. Now this requires some time and energy, obviously, um, so make sure it's something you wanna spend the rest of your life talking about. Um, and then the job is to make your specialty relevant even when it's not. So uh, if your area is Hasidism, for example, um, how can you tie that to whatever's happening in the news? Uh, how is the economy and, the un and unemployment affecting Hasidic communities in America? Uh, how are Orthodox Jews gonna vote in 2012? How is the war in Libya impacting Jews in America? I mean, you can't wait for your specialty to come up you have to find ways to make it relevant all the time. And uh, tying your, your opinion into something that's going on in the news is an art all to itself. 
And you get good at it once you do it enough, but that's a huge part of this job. The third way is terrible. Um, you start working at a small local newspaper or television station. You work there for five years for no money. You move to a mid-sized paper or television station and work there for five years and no money. Then you move to a large newspaper or television station and you work there for 10 years for no money. And maybe, maybe one day they will let you start writing opinion or going on air. It's a very long road. But I will say this, the, uh, the people who come from years of news experience, I can always tell who they are, they are incredibly savvy when it comes to the media. And that can be a boon all to itself. Um, incredibly savvy people. They're also like 100 because it's taken forever, but <laughs> mazel to them. So that's it. I'm sure there are other ways involving um, impropriety, like sleeping with someone, knowing someone, doing something scandalous, paying someone. I'm, I'm sure that's a, an easy road in as well. But if you'd like to be a good person still, um, those are the three ways. That's really it. There aren't a whole lot of other avenues into this business. Um, I'm not saying it's impossible to come from another angle, but that's it. And when I look around at my, at my colleagues, the stories are all the same. It's, it's road one, two, or three. Um, it's hard work, but a pretty great job if, if you can get it. I'm pretty lucky to go on TV and write in newspapers and magazines and just talk about my opinions. Um, it's pretty good work, especially in this kind of economy when I have absolutely no other skills to market. Um, but you should keep in mind that a lot of work goes into a five-minute television hit or uh, hosting a three-hour radio show or writing a book or writing a 700-word column. It's a lot of work. And it has to come from sort of a breadth of um, experience and knowledge. And you have to be very sure of your opinions because you are going to be treated badly for them um, by lots of people, not just you know, fans and haters, but other writers, editors. I mean, it's, it's not always a polite business, even if you are nice and polite yourself. So that's my shtick. I want to turn now to your questions. Spoke a little generally because I know people probably have very specific interests here and I don't want to, I don't want to leave anyone out. So ask me your questions and hopefully I can give you some good specific personal answers and advice. Yes, sir. We all know that you can browse forever and where does the day go? So how do you mm -hmm. target your sources yeah. to make sure they really give you something of value? That's such a great question. And consuming news, especially when you do it for a living, becomes something of a science. And you have to get good at it because you're right. There is so much out there. There are pretty good news aggregators, and you're going to laugh, but Twitter is one of them. When I can target and pre-select the writers that I want to follow and the magazines and newspapers and television networks that I want to follow, and I'm just looking at their headlines, well, then I pretty much have customized my, new, my news experience. That's been really helpful. Um, but you have to know what you're looking for. So you have to know the, the voices you want to hear, the, the topics you want to hear. And I read left and right. I get some of my best ideas by reading, um, you know, sort of lib liberally newspapers and magazines and seeing what the other side is saying. If you just want to read in a vacuum and have your own opinions affirmed, your, your, your writing and your work isn't going to be as, as smart and, and sharp as it, as it could be. So, I mean, it's, it, it takes some time to get very good at just getting what you want. But over time, once you get the hang of it and you know what you're looking for and you have success with going back to certain sites all the time, then you just start making your list and um, it becomes something manageable. So you're not spending four hours just browsing the web sort of haphazardly. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Have you appeared on NPR or PBS? And if so, are they you know, treated the same way they would if anybody else does, or is this just a gig? 
I ha um, the question was, have I appeared on NPR or PBS and how have they treated me? Um, I have. And I gotta say, I mean, I do a lot of liberal TV and radio. Oh, really? Um, you know, everyone from Bill Maher to the Joy Behar show, Larry King, Alan Combs, I do MSNBC. I mean, I'll go anywhere <laughs> um, as, long as, as long as they're nice to me. And I gotta tell you, generally they are. I mean, Joy Behar, as much as I disagree with her, is so sweet to me. Um, Bill Maher is great to me. I don't mind disagreeing with people. I don't even mind heated conversations on air, but in the green room, I don't want to be treated like, you know, persona non grata. You invited me, I'm coming here. Be nice to me. And pretty much everyone is. So while I know um, I'm not going to a friendly audience when I do something like NPR or um, Joy Behar, I'm prepared, I know what to expect. And um, I adapt according to my surroundings. But I think people that only do comfortable media um, are A, preaching to the choir and really missing an opportunity to reach a new audience, and B, a little lazy. I mean, it keeps me on my toes to do those other outlets. And I, I, I enjoy those opportunities as much as any of the others. Anyone else? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They're very aware uh, of those people and not at all sensitive to that. They're, I mean, I guess you could call it irresponsible, but networks especially know their audiences and they know how to get people riled up. They know how to get their attention, and that's what they do. It's unfortunate uh, that the news business has become so crass, but that's largely what it is. And frankly, if you want news without theater, um, you gotta watch C-SPAN. You know, I mean, that, that's, that's TV news today. It's as much a performance as it is Uh, I think people in the media feel very divorced from the cause and effect of what they're saying and what they're doing. And I've witnessed that on any number of big stories that then have sort of real world consequences. Uh, and it's, it's, it's unfortunate, sure, but that's really at the top. The people who are doing the groundwork, the reporting, I think they take their job very seriously, and most reporters that I've met have very high ethics and integrity and, and journalistic standards, but the people at the top, you have to remember, are, are business people. They're not journalists. So when they're making business decisions, I think that comes from a place of money. Yes, sir? I'll repeat it. Well, he wants to know how the debt limit uh, debate is gonna turn out. Um, I'm happy to answer this, although I do kind of want to stick to the how-to questions, just in case anyone has them, but, you know, it's a mess, obviously. And what I think is gonna happen is we're gonna reach some kind of short-term, probably multi-step um, plan of action that's gonna make no one happy. And then we'll be talking about this for another six months. There's, there's really no, no, no way out because the Senate, uh, the, the Dennett Sem bill is not going to pass. The House Republican bill is not going to pass, and Obama hasn't, uh, doesn't have a plan himself. So it's these two people, these two groups talking, neither of which are going to happen. So I think that some kind of short-term, watered-down, very ineffective solution to just raise the debt ceiling and then deal with spending later, is what we're going to get. Anyone else? Yes, sir. Thank you, Karen. Uh, two probably unrelated questions. Um, what, what about blogging as a news medium? 
Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Did everyone hear that? No. Uh, Two-part question. The first is, um, what about blogging as a road to punditry? And you're right. Blogging has become somewhat more establishment. But it's hard. There's a lot of bloggers. There's a lot of people occupying that space because, frankly, it's very easy to occupy that space. You can do it in your pajamas. And well, right. Well, right, and um, you don't have to have an editor. So, while it can be, if you're, if you're very good at anything, you can, you can make it happen. But you have to be really good at that. Saying something new, saying it well, really latching on to a moment in time, to then sort of vault into the world of book writing and newspaper writing and magazine writing and doing television. And people have done that but out of the population of bloggers, it's very few people. So it's absolutely a, a root. But there are some editors and producers who will look down on blogging as a legitimate road into sort of mainstream news. There's so many new media outlets out there though, if that's what you want to do and that's the space you're comfortable in, you can absolutely find a way to get published and get you know, into, into broadcast media. Um, the second part of your question was, do you, did I, have a, an easier time getting into punditry coming from the right? Yeah, I think there was a lot going into it. I was young, I was a woman, and I was Republican, and I lived in New York City. I mean, it was, people, people found that interesting for whatever reason. Fine, um, I didn't make it up, it's true. Um, so I think that hook, especially when I wrote the first book, which was a political book, dispelling the myths about conservatism, I think some people found that probably interesting more than, you know, some old white guy with gray hair. That's a little bit more predictable in that, in that space. But um, there are very few of us in media compared to, you know, media's a very, it's a liberal place, and I've worked at liberal publications and media outlets, and it, find places to work. Um, so, so there are fewer of us that probably works to our advantage some of the time. And some of the time it makes it a little, a little tricky. Um, there are certain outlets that like to have a resident conservative. There are other outlets who want them gone, completely gone, not represented at all. So you just have to learn who your friends are and, and who are not your friends. Anyone else? Yes, sir. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Well, if you come academically, it's easier because you're you're publishing anyway um, in journals and and stuff like that. So you have physical material to show someone, and then it's a matter of okay, I'm going to take this academic paper I just wrote, or this position paper I just wrote and I'm going to turn it into something more mass market, a column that would then go into a newspaper uh, or a magazine, and you have to know your, your outlet, and great piece of advice, Writer's Market is the best book you could get. It gives you, and it's they, uh, new every year, and it's a list of editors at all the publications, large and small, what they want, what they expect, how to submit. So then you you'd turn your academic writing into something a little bit more mass market, you'd submit it and you'd keep doing that until you get published. Once you get published a few times, then it, you, know, you, you build a reputation as the guy that always writes about this. And then it's up to you to self-promote. So getting published once is great, but not if no one hears about it, not if you don't tell anyone. So editors love self-promotional writers because they don't have to promote their writers at all, they know I'm gonna do it for them. So when I have my daily news column every Wednesday, I put it on Twitter, I put it on Facebook, I send it out to my mass mailing list, 
I talk about it on television, I talk about it on the radio, they love it. An editor loves that. So it's up to you then, once you get some clips and you get published, to alert the media, literally. I just wrote about this, it's really timely. Um, you know, I, I'd be happy to talk about X, Y, and Z. Here's my background, I am an expert in this field. And then it becomes a matter of, uh, like I said, keeping your area of interest relevant through the changing news cycle. You might have to wait a little longer than a generalist would in between those, those hits, but it's really up to you to keep you know, your, your area of interest on people's minds and tie it into what's going on today. But if you're good on television, professional, punctual, prepared, you write well, you're, you're someone that people would want to work with, especially if you have interesting things to say about a very specific topic. Sir? Oh yeah, there, I mean, there's a whole business of it. Um, in fact, I know of, I have a close friend who runs a firm that just does ghostwriting for politicians, for the op-eds that they place, the books that they write, the speeches they give. So that's very common. Um, it's not common for like columnists to have ghostwriters. <laughs> that would sort of defeat the purpose. <laughs> but it's certainly common in, in politics that, and, and I've been approached to ghostwrite books. It's, not what I do, but um, that happens all the time. Yeah. Yes, sir. Right. Right. I'm not worried. <laughs> Take your time. <laughs> What a terrible person. <laughs> yeah. It's also satire, and that should be pointed out. Right. 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 And I would guess that even amongst those folks, as well as amongst watchful, liberal progressives, 
Yep. Uh-huh. I don't understand the point. So we can teach that to be right, but I also want to bring it back uh, because I promised I would get Is there a question? Yeah. Okay. Um, it's, it's an honest question. Sure. Even though I did entertain thoughts that I was a bad person, ultimately I thought, wow, she's doing something interesting. She was ticking me and a lot of people off. And I want to know more about why she's doing it and why she's doing it. Okay. So ultimately my question and this is just sort of evidence of what I've seen in my reading. Uh -huh. My question is what ends do justify these sorts of movements? Uh -huh. How far should one be willing to go in pursuing one's career aspirations? Okay. Um, it's a good question, it's a fair question, and I appreciate that you were very polite about it. Thank you. Um, yeah, no, I believe me, no problems here. Um, one, this is a little hard to unpack, you said a lot. Um, one, again, satire. That doesn't dismiss the idea that words still have meaning and power, and I understand that. And I write serious stuff, and I write satirical stuff. Um, one notch above joking about genocide, I don't agree. Um, or date rape. I don't see the comparison to joking about um, polar bears and deer and trout being compar comparable to mass killing of people or raping women. They're just not comparable. Maybe in your mind, they are. Maybe in your mind, those things are on this on the same level. In my mind, they're totally not. But that's okay. We, we can disagree on that. Um, in terms of the way I approached it, it's a, it's a satirical column, and it's one I, I no lo longer have, but the diary was a satirical approach to sort of the political pieties of the day. And asserting in that introductory column um, that I was every conservative stereotype you have worse, um, you know, you have, you have had nightmares about was my way of saying, I'm going to play right into your stereotypes about who you think I am and embrace it. Now, none of that's true. None of, none of that is true. Yes, I hunt deer. I don't relish killing deer. That's not what it's about for me. Um, yes, I fish for trout. I would not pull everyone out of the Housatonic. First of all, that would take forever. Second of all, it's illegal. There are laws against it. Um, I would never TP the White House. I would never, it's just, I would never do that. Um, that you know of. But, no, I mean, the, the satire was a full-throated embrace of the stereotypes that exist constantly and are constantly bandied about by the left against conservatives, well-meaning conservatives, who do support hunting or the Second Amendment um, or, or other issues in, in, in very well-meaning ways. And legitimately, not um, because they're bloodlusty. I was embracing those stereotypes to make a point, and one that uh, apparently I did. So there are, there are absolutely different ways to come at opinion writing, and if you find that you have um, a good grasp of humor, then it's great that you can use that. If you don't, if you're Krauthammer, who's brilliant, not that funny in his writing. He can be funny when he's at the table. Sometimes it's dry. But then, you know, he should write serious stuff, and he does. He does better, better than almost anyone I know. Um, to your last point, what goes into the, the, the thought process behind tackling these subjects and how do I sort of internalize and take responsibility for, for what I'm saying. Well, my goal has always been to find a way to write for a living. Um, the TV and the radio came to me and that's all fine and it's fun but I get turned on by writing. So my goal has always been to write 
clever, interesting, thought-provoking, um, intelligent pieces on the topics that interest me, whether that's religion or sports or politics or whatever. Um, and I've been lucky that, I, that I've, I've been given that platform to do it, and it's one I take incredibly seriously. As, as jokey as that particular column was, I've written for the Washington Post and um, you know, the American Spectator in very serious capacities. But there is a place for humor, there's a place for satire, especially in politics, it begs for it. And I think that serves a function as well. And it doesn't mean that you're flippant about your, your opinions and what you're putting out there. In fact, I spent a lot of time crafting that. And it was intentional to get, get a rise out of people. Um, and and to, tho to that end, um, I didn't feel bad about writing what I wrote to justify the means, which were to introduce this column, introduce myself, catch people a little off guard, and embrace stereotypes perpetuated not by me, but by others. I hope that answers your question. Yes. Yeah. Right. And I think that's what comes out of a lot of so much of the media and the politics of the country. I mean, how much of a chance do you have shoved up the wall of democracy when this is what democracy looks like? Well, democracy works when more people get to speak, not fewer. So the yeah. idea that It certainly does. Um, we've always been a very polarized nation. In fact, if you look back at media history and you read some journalism from the past, it is vile, vile. Um, and the politics of our nation has, has, has always been very, very polarized. I think that's something to embrace because we care greatly and passionately about these issues. If there was apathy and everything was sort of watered down, um, I, I don't think that would be an indication that we were taking these issues very seriously, especially our role in, in, in the global arena as, as influencers. But I do want to say, it's not the job of the media, and I agree, the media is incredibly hostile, especially if you're looking at like the talking heads. But it's not their job to resolve conflicts. It's their job to agitate these opinions and, and, and speak articulately and passionately about these conflicts in ways that maybe, maybe help others to resolve conflicts, but no one on television, <laughs> certainly not on the networks, is thinking, how can I resolve this conflict today? And that's not why you watch, hopefully. Hopefully you are not looking to Rush Limbaugh or um, you know, Bob Beckel or um, Ed Schultz to resolve conflicts. That's not their job. They're speaking to a vox populi. They're, they're voicing ideas that everyone else has, but for some reason they do it in a more interesting way. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, that is the power of the media, absolutely. They can be very influential as can Hollywood, as can politics. I mean, I think you're you're right, but that's sort of conflating problems, and news consumers need to take responsibility. People like Rush Limbaugh and Judy, Judge Judy, who I love, by the way, um, only exist because there's a market for them. There's a demand. People want to watch them. If no one was watching them, they wouldn't be successful. They'd be on the fringes, um, not making any money. So we've, we've demanded this kind of news experience, good or bad. We've asked for it, and we've accepted it. And if we want better, then we have to demand better, and we don't.
Well, the media does. There, there are media outlets that do, and I'll, I'll get to your question, I'm sorry. Um, there are media outlets that do that, and you're freely available to find them and live completely in that space and turn off all the, the rest of the noise. But I don't see the media in the same kind of altruistic role that, that you do. Um, but, but that doesn't mean you're, you're not allowed to. You, you're allowed to feel that way and, and want a better media. The last book I wrote was demanding a more responsible press where religion was concerned. I don't like the way that religion is covered by the media um, for many reasons that we don't need to get into, but you have the right to want a more responsible press. And it's a frustration that I've heard from both sides for, for years. Yes, ma'am. Okay, good point. Hmm. Well, the question was, do I get um, is more criticism as a woman expressing strong opinions? Are women met with more hostility because they're women, you know, expressing strong opinions? Um, I haven't experienced that. I get um, just as much hate mail as Sean Hannity does. I, I don't, actually that's a lie, he gets way more. But, <laughs> but I get plenty. Um, and I, I really haven't found that. I've found certain criticisms from other people to be sexist in the content, but I haven't found that because I'm a woman, I'm, I get targeted or I really haven't found that, and I hate playing identity politics because, frankly, it's a lot harder these days to be an old white guy and get a job on television than it is to be a young, cute, blonde girl and get a job on television. They face different hurdles. So it's hard regardless. It's a hard industry. It's competitive, and it's limiting. So I think regardless, you just have to work hard for it and prove that you're smart and prepared and professional and all of those things. You're gonna get hostility for any number of reasons. Um, I haven't felt that particular threat. Anyone else? Sir? Uh, I recently heard you on uh, the Ron and Fenn show discussing your uh, book about religion. Okay. And uh, I mean, you have a great interview. Mm -hmm. Yes. What was the process in saying yes to the Ron and Fed show? And would you ever say no to Howard Stern? Have you thought about <laughs> No, I would not say no to Howard Stern. But I would, I do have standards if you're asking. Um, <laughs> it's funny because this past April Fools, I am working for Glenn Beck, um, which we won't go into, but I'm working for Glenn Beck. And this past April Fools, I was coming from a, a a job and coming back into the studio and I tweeted as a joke, just came from my Maxim photo shoot, hope Glenn and my mom aren't too upset. Now it was April Fools, I didn't expect anyone to believe this. I walk into the, people did, I walk into the office and Glenn knew I was joking but was like really excited about it. And he was like, you should really do it. And I was like, stop exploiting me to my face. Um, and then he wanted to like run with it on the air. So we did a bit on the air about it where he acted indignant and very upset with me. And I acted sort of like, what, it's my body. I can do what I want, um, which was a joke. We did it on the air for like 20 minutes. He loved it, but, and then afterwards said, you know, if you ever want to do that, you can. I said, I have, I have a father. I would not do that. GQ on the other hand, I might consider, but that's totally different. Um, no, I do have standards, and I've done some of the, you know, like Opie and Anthony. I've done those shows. It's entirely up to me how far I want to go. I mean, they can ask a disgusting, terrible question. Um, I can either leave, I can not answer it, I can answer it diplomatically, or I can go, f go for it. And it's a decision I make all the time, but it's a decision I make regardless of whether I'm with some raunchy host or I'm with a, you know, liberal host or a crazy conservative host. Those are decisions you make all the time in radio and television and when you're on the spot. 
about how you want to comport yourself and handle yourself. And if you set the tone, I, I don't get asked a lot of gross questions because I don't, you know, I don't op I'm not open for that. And most people know that. Can I ask one follow-up? Yes. Um, is it ever too late to start this process? I know. No. It is not too late. This is not an entirely young person's business. I mean, look at all of the people occupying the single chair on MSNBC or Fox or CNN. Larry King was literally like 300 years old. <laughs> I think I once asked him, what was it like interviewing Charlemagne? <laughs> he didn't get it, obviously. Um, it's, you know, the media at least still respects some, some seasoning, um, you know, ha having some experience. I mean, they'll put young reporters out there and on camera people and pundits can be young, but no, there's still absolutely um, an opportunity to do this at any age, especially print. I mean, if you, can, if you can write and you can be provocative and interesting and fresh, it doesn't really matter. In fact, when I started in writing and had no TV, you know, and people didn't know how old I was or what I looked like. Most people thought I was a dude because of my name. So there's no, I mean, print journalism, there's still sort of a veil, which is why I wanted to go into it. I wanted to be anonymous. It's out the window. But um, for TV and radio, too, I mean, as long as you're saying something interesting and you're saying it well, I mean, look at, look at the people that are on. There are 100, half of them. So don't be discouraged or feel like this is something I can't start now. Um, you absolutely can. Yes, ma'am. Interesting. The question was, do I think that's how Obama got elected because his opponent, John McCain, was old, essentially. Um, Obama was elected for many reasons. We had a, a very unpopular president. We were in two unpopular wars. And we had a very, I would say, incompetent opponent in John McCain, as much as I enjoy him and respect him. He was not our best opponent. Um, just to keep things in perspective, Obama won by six percentage points. Was not the, you know, the, the mandate that some, some have, have sort of rewritten that to be. It was a success, and he got a ton of the, the youth vote and the minority vote, absolutely. I don't know that John McCain's age was the only reason. It was probably a factor, but I think there were a lot of reasons why Obama won. One more. Okay. One more. Okay. Um, do you have any more I do. Okay. Have you started with Megan? She's in L.A. now, but yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. I am friendly with Megan um, McCain. She's a lovely girl. She's always been really nice to me. And while we do very different things, and our careers are sort of going in different directions, she's been nice to me. That's, that's really all I care about. I don't take politics that seriously in my, in my personal life. Um, so I have lots of liberal friends. If I didn't, in New York City, I'd have no friends. So <laughs> you just, you know. Yes, ma'am? That's a great question, and I won't name names, but there are certainly pundits who do that, um, who find controversial opinions, even if they don't really believe them, and have made great careers out of just being controversial, counterintuitive, contrarian. That's not comfortable for me. I really like to be able to stand behind whatever I say, um, and and be able to justify it in some way. So I'm probably worse off career-wise and financially um, because I, I don't do a lot of that. But um, for instance, I was only on Keith Overman's worst person list once, just once. That's like nothing in this business. So I really don't do the shock value kind of stuff. Other people do and they do it really well. I'm just not comfortable there. So I try to be a little bit more 
nuanced and authentic, and if it doesn't happen to get 7,000 page hits or whatever, then that's okay. Anyone else? Yes, ma'am. Oh, I loved it here. Um, I just loved it here. And I wasn't political. I wasn't involved in politics, campus or otherwise. Um, so I, I, don't, I don't think I got a lot of sort of political school here. But I certainly refined my writing, both at the paper and in classes, absolutely. Um, and I mean, I just loved everything about it here. I loved everything. I made friends that I've had now for 15 years and um, was just talking to Bud here about maybe coming back for a PhD. I mean, I would move here if there was a job for me to do. Um, but I really think when it comes to this kind of work, you don't, you don't learn a lot in school. And that's not to say that school can't be valuable, but this really is an on-the-job or in-the-field kind of learning experience. Um, you know, I, I've learned how to adjust myself for the audience that I'm going to be speaking to or writing to. You, don't, you can't learn that in school. That said, I did not take any journalism classes, and I didn't go to J school. So I can't tell you if that would have been helpful. I don't know. Um, the people I talked to largely say it was a waste of time, but maybe not for everyone. I'm sure classes are helpful to some people in this business. But for me, it's been largely intuitive and hard work. Anyone else? Yes, sir. Well, I didn't say from the real world. And when I was talking about people in media, I meant media the business are sort of divorced from the opinions that they're, that they're putting out there, yeah. Often they don't, but sometimes they do. I mean, if you look at what's happening with News of the World, this is a case where a media magnate is bearing responsibility, or, I mean, we'll see what happens with him, but is, at least there's the um, appearance of you know, sort of, um, I don't know, being held responsible um, for actions that his business took, with or without his knowledge. I'm not privy to that. But uh, some, sometimes there is social responsibility. Sometimes there is judgment for terrible decisions. And I don't know a single journalist who would say that what happened at News of the World was acceptable. That's not journalism. What, what, what they were doing was not journalism. So, I mean, you saw that with Jason Blair at the New York Times. You saw that with um, Stephen Glass, um, which, by the way, if you haven't seen Shattered Glass, it's a great movie about plagiarism uh, at a magazine. Um, there, there are repercussions. Not often enough, but uh, there are. And as much as I... Um, I, I don't want to talk about WikiLeaks because I don't view them as... Um, a, journalism outfit. Um, there are organizations, watchdogs, media watchdogs, that try to hold the media responsible, both for accuracy and responsibility and civility. And there are those engines out there. Um, again, not entirely enough. And I do a lot of reporting on the media and the business of the media. Um, and I'd like to see more of that, but it does exist. Anyone else? Yes, sir. I'm so glad you asked that. Nothing. 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 How much does one get paid for doing a television panel or a half an hour interview with Glenn Beck? Nothing. Um, there are contributors at all of the networks, MSNBC, CNN, Fox. They have contracts. They are contracted pundits who have a year-long or two or three-year-long contract. Usually they have other jobs because it's, they're not large contracts. But people who are not contributors and who do all the networks, like me, get paid nothing. Nothing. The um, honor is entirely mine. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's something you do. I do it to support the writing. It's great exposure for my writing because every time I go on television, underneath my name, it's called a Chiron. It says S.E. Cup. 
Daily News, or SC Cup Town Hall Editor, or SC Cup Author of which, whichever book. That's why I do it. Um, it's not for the money. But the, the, you know, the, the Sean Hannity's and the Glenn Beck's, they have multi-million dollar contracts, but they're not, you know, occasional pundits. That's their job. Um, so do, do not go into this if you are expecting to become a millionaire. Doesn't happen. Doesn't happen. And, and that's, that's everyone. You just do it for free. And it actually weeds a lot of people out because they start doing it and they think, okay, when am I going to get paid? And then they run into the, you know, head production office at Fox or CNN and they say, I need money for this. And they say, there's the door. Go ahead. It's, it's just not done that way, unfortunately. Anyone else? Oh, yes. I think the media, I mean, it's, while the media as an industry is very liberal, it just is, um, there are a lot of conservative media outlets. They do very well. Fox News is making a ton of money. Um, there are, you know, f talk radio is almost entirely conservative, the successful ones anyway. Um, there's a lot of online media for for conservative media. So there's, there's plenty of space for everyone. But as a, a discipline and an industry, it's a, it's, a liberal, it's a liberal field. It just is. Now, obviously, that hasn't hindered um, a lot of conservatives' success. But that's, that's just a fact of establishment media. Almost all of the networks, top to bottom, liberal. There are liberals working at Fox. I mean, liberal producers and liberal cameramen and liberal business executives. I mean, it just, it just is. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. At the time, right. So, like, 60s? 50s? I mean, yeah, it's really hard to sort of look at the demography of that. And so, so this idea of labeling the media as sex, but I'm over here. And then you're trying to make, you want to take everybody out of the culture. And I'm the one going to the person that was on the whole line of fucking stuff. Bull! Okay. Look at the dollars, advertising dollars in the media. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Are, what's, uh, do you have a question? I, I really, I really wouldn't know. Oh well, they are. I mean, that's a fact. Oh, you can say that. I'm telling you my experience from inside of it. Okay. It's my experience. Yeah. By what? Sorry? I don't have data. I have experience. I'm just telling you my experience. But I'm sure there is data out there to be mined. I don't have it. I, I don't know about the ad dollars. I'm a writer. Anyone else? Yes, sir. Yeah. No, it's a great question. The question was, if I don't make any money going on television, where do you get money? Um, there's book money. It's not a ton, but there's book money. 
Um, I do get paid for my writing now, which is great. For a while, I didn't. For a while, I wrote for free, because that's what you do when you're starting out. But now I make pretty good money for my columns. Um, there's a lot of money in column syndication. Uh, there's some money to be made if you can get a contract with someone. I have a contract with Glenn now. It's a full-time job. Um, so if you can get a contract in media, that can, that can be some money. Um, but largely, bouncing around the networks and doing five-minute hits does not pay the bills. It doesn't pay at all. Again, it's not a field you go into expecting to make a ton of money. I know you look at you know, the big wigs, and they do. They make a ton of it. That's hard. That's really rare. I'll take one more. Yes, sir? Right, so, so the the yeah, the absolutely, and that happens all the time, yeah. where editors make decisions about stories not to talk about. Absolutely, and that's infuriating to someone who cares about that story. And it's really hard to spot unless you're reading all the news all the time and can sort of make the judgment, okay, well, these guys are talking about it, but these guys aren't. And then you have to watch over and over and over again and keep reading or watching TV to see how long this goes on. And that happens all the time. Um, reading editorial bias is, is a, a little like detective work because you don't always see what, what, what's going on. A lot of the time, it's what's not being talked about in, in where the, the bias is revealed. You have to be very skilled as a news consumer these days. You have to be a detective if you really want to get straight stories. It's hard. I mean, not just me, all of us. We all are in that position. And I would hope, and I guess this is a parting statement, that we can all, as news consumers, take a little bit more responsibility for the way we digest news as well, instead of just pointing at the media and saying, well, they're doing a terrible job. Most of the time, they are. But instead of just pointing at them and saying, you should be doing this differently, you're terrible people, I mean, we, we have to be better news consumers, too and more diligent and responsible about the way we watch television, the way we read, the way we go online, the way we listen to the radio and all of that. So I hope this has been helpful. And any of you wishing to enter this field, I wish you all the luck in the world. It's incredibly rewarding. It's hard work, but I could not be happier. And uh, I hope to see some of your names and faces in the news. Thanks for coming. <laughs>